Building health advocates one generation at a time. That's our theme for this program. And we're certainly honored to have Dr. Nina Horowitz here with us. Now, when we were trying to decide who our speaker would be, she was tops on our list. And we're just honored that you graced us with your presence today. So, Dr. Horowitz. Good morning, and thank you so much. Um, I, I'd like to start by echoing a little bit of what Rosa had to say. I want to thank Dawn so, so much for the, her kind invitation to come speak today to all of you. Um, it is an incredible honor for me to be here. I knew Dawn's grandmother over many years, and I, I feel her loss. And, you know, I know you all feel Phyllis's loss, uh, uh, Dawn's loss, Phyllis. Um, her grandmother was a woman of incredible integrity. She had an incredible love for life. She really dedicated herself to this organization, which is a phenomenal organization, which has brought incredible support to women in New Haven for years and years. Um, so Dawn, thank you so much. And I really feel fortunate and privileged to be here today to speak. Um, I, I'm also pleased to be here to talk a little bit um, to the younger women in this audience. I know that's our focus today building health advocates one generation at a time. Um, and it's a particularly important subject to speak to young women about because, you know, you feel pretty invincible when you're a kid and when you're a teenager, when you're a young adult. You don't think things can happen to you. And breast cancer is always a disease that's a disease of a community. You know, women, individual women get breast cancer and they have issues about having breast cancer and they have to make a journey through their breast cancer treatment. But every woman who has breast cancer is a daughter, maybe a mother, maybe a sister, is a member of a community, maybe a member of a church, often a member of a workplace. And so when a single woman gets breast cancer, it has a profound impact on their world and all the people associated with them. And it profoundly affects families. And so it is important for us to raise the consciousness of our daughters. I have a 20-year-old daughter, um, and I hope, you know, that I have done some of this for her as well. But I want to particularly focus more than 60% of breast cancers are so so current issues. women who are over the age of 55. Um, and so one of the things we want to do when we're talking about raising people's consciousness is we don't want to terrify them or scare them or make them feel fearful about this because, in fact, Despite our perceptions, we all know the very young women who have had breast cancer. The majority of women who will have this disease are those of us who are not in our 20s, 30s, and 40s. Um, the real cause of cancer is not really known, but at the root of cancer, this is my one second of a little science, um, cancer is really caused by a failure of cell regulation. And you know, normally our cells are divide they grow, they die in a very orderly fashion. They, new cells come to take the place of dying cells, and that's how we all are who we are. This happens as a normal part of our bodies. But there's something called an oncogene, and that's a change or mutation in your DNA of your cells, and it causes a failure in the feedback of the system. And this allows unregulated cell division. And that's actually the root cause of cancers. These cells start to divide even when you don't need them. They're not needed to replace cells that have not yet died. And that's what causes this uncontrollable growth that turns into a cancer. Now, you know, young women are in a dilemma. They're at much lower risk for breast cancer, and they're not included in most of our national guidelines for screening. There's not enough risk to make it worth screening them as a population growth. And so it's much more important for our younger women to really understand their health risks. And they need to really understand how to examine themselves and how to assess their risks and how to, most importantly, be a health advocate for themselves. It is the young women who, by and large, will have the experience of going to one of their physicians and saying they have a symptom and feeling like it's not being taken seriously. Physicians know that when 60 and 70 and 80 year old women show up and have a new breast symptom, that there is a substantial risk that those women could in fact have breast cancer and it is in general taken seriously. But the 20 and the 30 and the 40 year old women have many, many non-cancer related reasons to have breast symptoms. 
And it's very easy for their health care providers not to really listen to what those women are saying to them and to just pass by it. And so it really means that you, young women, need to be good advocates for yourself. You have to not give it up until you're comfortable and you have an answer. Um, national guidelines, as I'm sure you all know, and I don't want to bore you with, you know, information that you all are comfortable with, but, you know, national guidelines say women need to start having their annual mammograms at age 40, and most of you know even that recommendation has now become controversial with some national groups saying that maybe it's really not cost effective to be screening women at 40, and we could have a whole conversation about how health policies are made and how people figure out whether something is, quote, cost effective. Um, none of our national recommendations explicitly make the statement that you have to start getting your screening 10 years younger than your family's youngest affected member. If your family had somebody who was 45 with breast cancer, your mammogram started 35. If your family has somebody who is 32 with her breast cancer, your mammogram started 22. That is never included in any of our national guidelines. It is a terrible omission. That is how you need to know this information for yourself. You are supposed to get your mammograms when you're in your 20s, if mom had her breast cancer in her 30s. Um, Let's talk for a second also about this whole issue of dense breast tissue. And I bet if I took a poll in this room, many of you have recently had mammograms where you've gotten the letter sent back to you saying, your mammogram really looks pretty peachy, but you know, you have dense breast tissue, maybe you really need to talk to your doctor. Um, we are both helped and disadvantaged in Connecticut. We are the only state out of 50 that actually has a state law requiring radiologists since uh, October of 2009 to directly contact women and tell them about the quality of their mammogram. And I'm not talking about the technical quality, did the technician do a good job. We're talking about will your mammogram show your breast cancer if you have one. There's also increasing information that women who have this so-called dense breast tissue, and what do we mean by that? What we mean by that is the proportion of milk-making glandular breast tissue relative to the fatty breast tissue in your breast is skewed towards the glandular tissue. So that when the radiologist looks at your mammogram, what they see is a lot of white. What does a cancer look like on a mammogram? White. So it's a needle and haystack problem. If you have really dense breast tissue, the ability for your mammogram to detect that is very compromised. Connecticut has passed the law that says they have to tell you that. Well, if you have a lot of dense breast tissue, our newer data also says you are probably also at increased risk for having breast cancer. That's new data. We never used to think that the composition of your breast affected your risk. But we now know that that's not true. So it's particularly important in the group of women with dense breast tissue who have, therefore, a slight increased risk of breast cancer to have additional imaging done, most commonly a breast ultrasound. This is particularly true in the younger women, premenopausal women, who disproportionately will have dense breast tissue. They're the people most likely to have a mammogram miss their cancer. So very important to know that about ultrasound, worth talking to your doctors about. Now, women who are adopted don't have family history information available to them, don't know what their blood families may have passed to them, are in a dilemma also. And if you're in one of those families where you actually don't know the history of your birth parents, I always encourage women to consider themselves to be at higher risk in that category. Never will hurt you to consider yourself to be at higher risk. We'll start looking at you a little earlier, screening you a little earlier. We don't want to miss something if we don't have your family history. Now, it's a, it's a perception that when younger women are often diagnosed at a, a higher, more serious stage of cancer and maybe don't do as well. 
Um, I say perception because if you actually look at the data, that is not completely borne out. But what is definitely true is that since we are not routinely screening the under... And so when we see 20 and 30 year old women with breast cancer, they are usually coming in because they feel a lump. And so it is important that you know how to do a breast exam on yourself and feel comfortable bringing to the attention of your doctors anything you find. Breast cancer, unfortunately, is the most common cancer associated with pregnancy. Anybody in the room who's been pregnant knows what your breasts feel like when you're pregnant. It's like they're aliens with a mind of their own. You know, and you can only imagine the dilemma of your physician trying to sort out if your symptom is real or not real. But it is true that breast cancer is the most common cancer of pregnancy. It does occur, unfortunately, every year. We see several women who are diagnosed when they are pregnant or just newly delivered of their children. It is really important that an evaluation be done if there is something that you have noticed in your breast while you're pregnant. We cannot do a mammogram when you're pregnant, but we can most certainly do an ultrasound. We can do a biopsy. We can evaluate it. You have enough to worry about when you're pregnant. You want a nice, healthy, happy child. You don't want to be worried that there's something in your breast that you don't know about. We can evaluate it and make it so that you don't have to worry about it. Now, I, I have a really special place in my heart for Sister's Journey because, unfortunately, I think a lot of the science and the support for women with breast cancer really focuses on the majority population of white women. And African American women are actually less likely than white women to get breast cancer. So I think the studies have been predominantly done in white women because they do make up the majority of women who develop breast cancer of all ages. It is very important for us to support women of color in their journey through this. And I think science is finally beginning to catch up on this a little bit. African American women are less likely as a group to get breast cancer, but they are more likely as a group to die of their breast cancers. They disproportionately get a kind of breast cancer that we label triple negative breast cancers. These are the breast cancers that do not respond to the female hormones, estrogen and progesterone, and therefore are much more likely to require chemotherapy as part of their treatment, and are much more likely to be aggressive in their biology. Um, there are a whole bunch of clinical trials now underway looking at these particular cancers with new chemotherapeutic agents now being developed specifically targeting this particular subgroup of cancers very important for the group of women who are African-American with their breast cancers. Um, that particular type of breast cancer also is the kind we see when there are families who carry the breast cancer gene or what's commonly referred to as the BRCA gene or BRCA genes. Those genes are found in African-American families. Um, those genes tend to cause these particular triple negative cancers. For those of you who have family members around and can figure out your family history, it is really important to do that before generations unfortunately die and you cannot access that information. If you were in a family where somebody under the age of 45 had breast cancer, you're in a family where there is a distinct chance that the BRCA gene exists. If you're in a family which has had a few generations of women with breast cancer, you're in a family where the breast cancer gene might exist. If you're in a family where breast cancer and ovarian cancer have both been seen, your family might carry the gene. There are other male type cancers, like prostate cancer, which also are increased in the families who carry this gene. These genes are passed uh, through families in a dominant fashion. It's different from sickle cell disease, where you actually need to get it from both your parents. In this gene, you only need one from one parent. So your father's side is just as important to you as your mother's side when you're figuring out your family risks. Um, now the good news. Despite everything I just said to you, the outcomes of treatment for breast cancer are actually phenomenal. And the vast majority of women with breast cancer will be cured and be survivors of their cancers. 
young women do just as well stage for stage for their cancers as older women. There is nothing intrinsically worse about your age when you're being treated for your breast cancer. We are very lucky to live in the era that we live in now because there are new things happening every year when we talk about what we can do to treat your breast cancer. We are doing things like nipple sparing mastectomies. Now, any of you who've had mastectomies in the past know what that experience was like. But in a certain subgroup of patients now, we actually can do breast removal and not even remove the nipple when we do that. And you can only imagine what cosmetically that can do for the outcome of that surgery. There was a big to-do earlier this year, 2011, about whether or not we actually needed to take out more of your lymph nodes, even if your lymph node was positive. So for those of you who have undergone full lymph node removals and knows what, know what that experience was like, we don't even necessarily need to do that now, again, in certain groups of women. And so we're at a point in time where there's a lot of information and things are getting better in physicians' ability to offer you choices about your treatment. Um, let me just finish up and turn this program over to Annette in a second by just also saying that increasingly in the last five years, what's become clear is that there are lifestyle choices that we can make that can really help decrease our risk of breast cancer. And some of these have been known for a while, but there are some that have really become increasingly highlighted recently. And that I want to really focus on one, and that one is exercise. And there has become a wave of data in the last five years talking about the impact of exercise, first of all, on women's risk of recurrent breast cancer, if you've already had breast cancer, but also on your risk of developing breast cancer if you've never had breast cancer. And this has become sort of overwhelming data as an independent variable in your risk. And this is where I think some of us of my age can really maybe have the most impact on our daughters. And, you know, I know to the younger people who are here today, you know, having your mother badger you about exercise is probably not high on your list of what you'd like to hear. But I do think we can impact our daughters by really encouraging some healthy lifestyle habits. And exercise is maybe a little less volatile a subject than some other subjects we all feel like we need to discuss with our daughters. But we can really affect their risk by encouraging them to become exercisers. And I'm not talking they have to go out there and you know play Olympic level basketball. I'm talking about feeling good about themselves and understanding that in their weekly routine, that not just once a week for five minutes, I'm talking you know three or four or five times a week, a half hour or 40 minutes, do something that makes your heart beat a little faster and makes you sweat so that you are getting some exercise because independent of everything else, that exercise affects hormones in your body that will actually impact your risk of breast cancer. So that's, that's my last little tidbit for today. And I, I, again, I just want to close by just thanking Dawn and thanking Sisters Journey for offering me the opportunity to come speak to you today. Thank you all for taking time out of your busy lives and your busy spring weekends to come join us today. And um, I'll be happy to be outside after this to answer questions if anybody has. Thank you again.